Well, don't we have a hot topic here today on Real Talk? And I'm with uh, Chandler Halliburton over at Remax. Chandler, why don't you just tell us how long you've been in the industry and what it is that you focus on? Yeah, I've been selling real estate for 14 years, maybe 15. Gosh, I can't remember. Residential primarily, do a lot of multi-unit stuff as well, some small scale commercial. I also have over 100 units myself, so a lot of the things I do is towards investment real estate. Run a team, number one team at Remax for Nova Scotia last year, probably again this year, we'll see. So yeah, love real estate, love all things real estate, love talking about real estate, so happy to be yes, here. Yes, and you certainly do, and this is why I called you, because I think I would have seen maybe TikTok or Instagram, and I was just as riled up as you when they were announcing the proposed 9% property tax increase. And I'm like, WTF, what do you mean? You know, they're going to potentially raise this. What were your thoughts on it when they were proposing this? Well, my thoughts were, well, not surprised because the proposal was 9.7%. And I Correct. think last year, the initial proposal was around, because this is the finance staff for the city. So they make a recommendation. They say, hey, listen, you guys want to spend all this money. Here's how much money we're short. And I think it was something like 150 million. In order to get that 150 million, we need to collect more tax from people. Because the only way the municipality makes money is through fees, mm -hmm. bus fees, fees when you go down and get a permit now fifteen dollars if you just want a copy of your property tax bills fifteen dollars parking tickets like these are how they make their fees that and then tax d transfer tax and property tax those are the only ways they can make money so when they're 150 million dollars short all of those things have to go up it's going to cost yeah. more money for activities at the library it's going to cost more money for halifax rec it's going to cost more money for parking tickets and it's going to cost more money in property tax and de-transfer tax so i wasn't surprised i also knew that this is going to be one of those cases nova scotia power does the same thing you ask for the big number so mm -hmm. when it actually gets down to about half of that people can pat themselves on back and say well what a hero we are because they wanted 9.7 percent and we're only going to increase property tax revenue by 6%. Aren't we fantastic? But so my question is, so I know there's always a forecast when they look at budgets, but I don't know about you in your business. When I looked at the COVID years of end of 2020, 2021, right up to probably the third quarter of 2022, I knew that things were changing. And when I came to make my budget for 2023, I'm looking back, okay, what did I do in 2019? I knew that my revenue wasn't going to increase because we didn't have that same type of market. Like, were, were they doing their budget off off COVID? Or I, so that's what I was struggling. And then the other thing I was struggling with because we know property taxes, right? They're always two years behind. The average house price from 2021 to 2022 went up by 70 grand. So. For those people who aren't capped with property taxes, right? Your taxes are going up anyway. So were they putting the property taxes up and adding a potential extra 9%? There's a few different things in there. One is yeah. like, what were they thinking? And that's a hard thing to answer. I mean, if we go back to 2021, money was raining from the skies, right? Yeah. And even myself, like I bought two very stupid little fun vehicles. They're like these little doom buggies basically. So we all made irrational purchases when money was just limitless, etc. But we, when we set our budgets, we do so in a tighter window than some of the municipal expenditures. And so if you've ever dealt with the city on anything, whatever you're trying to do takes years and years and years. And so mm -hmm. they were writing checks figuratively and literally in 2020 and 2021, but especially 2021, that only really came to be cashed here years later and yeah they thought things were just going to continue and they didn't and it's really frustrating but this is what it is to be an elected official right like you you are in there for this finite period and a lot of the people especially at a municipal level they love if you talk to any of them to be like we got that we got this Oh, when I was the counsel for this year, you talk to any retired counselor, yeesh. Like they'll talk your ear off about the library that they got opened and this and that, the other thing. They love ribbon cutting. And 
unfortunately, we did a lot of ribbon cutting for the last 24 months, and mm -hmm. now we have no monies. Like, and that's just frustrating because as a household or as an individual business owner, you cut your spendings, you cut your expenses when you get tight. We don't have yeah. the luxury of going to our employer and saying, I kind of bought two silly cars during like the height of COVID. Now I need some money. So I'm going to have to go ahead and get you to give me 10% more money. Like that doesn't work that way. Like we no, have actually expenses. When I look at some of the monies they would have collected, for example, in 2020. So I don't know the commercial side of things, but residential, they would have collected around $48 million. And in 20, when I did, I mean, this is just a rough estimate, right? Yeah, it seems low. And in 2023, they would have collected around 40 million by, I would say, around November 25th. But you know, again, I don't have access to the commercial stats, yeah. but there was about $5 million collected in for the sale of the Halifax Shopping Center, right? With yeah. the de-transfer tax. Yeah. And so I don't understand where the budget is. And again, our, is the fact that our property values have gone up, is that being taken into account? And I Yeah, question. so the way, there's a bit of a misconception of how they set property tax rates and overall property tax, because you also ask a counselor, some of them maybe don't come from a finance or economics background, so they will quickly point out that the tax rate has gone down. So the actual percentage you're being taxed is going down, but the, pr the value of your house is going up so much that you're paying more tax, albeit at a lower percent. But what they do is they look at the entire worth of all the real estate that they're going to tax, then they decide what budget they need, and that's how they engineer the property tax rate. So if there's a scenario whereby, like say you have a billion dollars worth of real estate, and you have a certain budget and you need to tax people at 1.2% to get the money that you need. Well, if real estate goes up by 300 million and you still want the same amount of tax revenue, you can technically lower people's tax rate because you're collecting from a larger base. So this was the other thing that they were really reliant on is that houses were going up and up and up. But when they say they want an additional 9.7% or they need an additional 9.7% of tax revenue, that doesn't mean that every individual's property tax is going to go up by 9.7%. It's, it's not going to be that no, severe. absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of that, so I went in and I thought, I'm just going to look at, pick a street and look at some property taxes. And I don't know why, but I went to Young Avenue. So That's one true. property just would have exchanged hands this year. It was assessed at two million, whatever. Exchanged hands, and now the new owner uh, has the uh, great opportunity of writing a twenty-four thousand dollar property tax uh, check to the city. A house on the same street never exchanged hands. Uh, similar in size, a lot, and because they've never exchanged hands they are paying it is sixteen thousand dollars in tax so is it fair that two houses on the on the same street one is paying twenty four thousand and the other is paying sixteen thousand uh just because they didn't sell mm -hmm. yeah what are the cap yeah so devil's advocate the whole point of the cap is that if some person buys a property in a neighborhood because it fits their budget and then yeah. for reasons beyond their control the value of their property skyrockets yeah. well they could potentially be forced out of their home by not being able to pay the property tax bill and yeah. people have viewed that as sort of unfair because like they didn't buy there thinking it was going to go up they just bought there because that's all what they can afford or you imagine something like a 75 80 year old senior living on a fixed income you know, who mm -hmm. bought a home in the 70s for $40,000. Now it's worth 1.4 million and they can't afford to make the property tax. So I understand in unique scenarios why property tax caps have Absolutely. worked Absolutely, and so I agree with that. The, the, the tricky thing is, increasingly we are all being told and we are all in this model where people buy real estate to invest. Mm -hmm. And you can now make an argument of, Oh, did you buy in that neighborhood because that's all you could afford? Or like, why did you buy a home? Like, you bought it to kind of make money. So maybe you have to eat the property tax associated with that. I've always thought that what there should be is at least at the time that it sells, because right now it's like someone's paid 5000 bucks a year on their property tax, 
and then they sell and the new person gets stuck with the $10,000 a year budget. I've sort of thought because they have your cap and they have your actual assessment that that gap essentially unpaid or uncaptured property tax value should just be deferred and then on the sale you actually owe that property tax. So maybe you save $2,000 a year on your property tax bill on average mm -hmm. over 20 years. So then when you sell it, you maybe pay $24,000 in a one-time installment off the sale of property. Now, I should be also very careful because I'm not in favor of more taxes. I think we pay too many taxes. No. So, but there's, there's, if you want to correct the system that is in place, that would be a way to correct the system in place. I just think we should be spending less money. That's what I think. So. Like, yes, there's, there's tons of loopholes in our tax system. I also don't think you should charge detransfer tax to a first time homeowner. Like mm -hmm. I, I have problems with all of that. My problem is that they've become a, addicted to the tax revenue. They've become addicted to the idea that there's going to be more of it every single year. And they have budgeted and spent accordingly. And now we have this problem. There was no thriftiness. There was no thought as to no. like, well, what would happen if this gravy chain, train starts to stop, right? And in general, I just think we spend too much money on stuff we don't need. I know. I grew up learning we should always have money for a rainy day. And I believe the way the real estate is now, we are a lot slower. I mean, we're back, I believe, to where pre-pandemic, where sometimes it takes a while to sell a house, and which yeah. leads me to this. So one of the things that the uh, provincial government would have put in last year that if you are not from uh, Nova Scotia, if you're not moving here, you are now paying an additional 5% detransfer tax. So we know that the average income here that can afford a house, let's say in within Halifax, two person, two people, a family plus kids, the house is around $500,000 or less. But the homes that are over 500,000 potentially, they are sitting yeah. a lot longer. So is it fair to the south? So we have one property right now, Chandler, that w we can see where where people are looking at it from. So from other parts of Canada, we have people who are looking at the property from the states. And one, foreign buyer ban, if you're from the anywhere outside of Canada, you can't purchase. But who in the heck, if I'm from Nova Scotia originally, now I've been living in Ontario for 30 years and I want to move back home and buy a house for the summer to come back and whatever. Is it fair now to hold up our sellers here locally that are over the $500,000 mark by that 5% detransfer tax? Is it fair? I think it should go. So this is a, a pervasive issue of the government seems to do two completely opposite things. So on the one hand, we're desperately trying to shove as many people into this province as possible, mm -hmm. like openly. That is our mandate. We've been the most successful province in the country at doing it. Why we want to then suddenly discourage people who have good incomes and are coming to buy houses and lay down roots, like why we want to discourage them, like we want to charge them more, but we will roll out the red carpet for people in general on the condition that we make them rent. Like this is why there, there's this strange, strange disconnect. We would rather have some student come here and be forced into the renter pool or some international laborer come here to also be forced into the rental pool and further perpetuate that problem. But we don't want people from other provinces who presumably have jobs and, and money and they want to come here also, but we're trying to dissuade them. Like that just fundamentally has never made sense. Uh, again, yeah. it, it was something that was put in when they were coming here in droves and the government's like, man, they're coming here in droves. Why don't we just like kind of try to charge them? And now they're not coming here in droves and it falls on its face and it becomes a moot point, but it made no sense to begin with for all kinds of reasons. Just because you I mean, can do something and can get money for it in the short term, doesn't mean it's a good idea and, and it's very short-sighted, but it's also oddly makes no sense. This is the other problem. When people realize that the only people paying, you remember when I said like, there's only a couple ways the city can get your money. Mm -hmm. And it's the big ones are if you own real estate, because if you don't own real estate, the only money the city is getting from you is when you park your car, when you ride the bus, when you go into the municipality, when you go into the library, like that's the only money they get from you. So we are bringing in a bunch of people and then 
they either can't buy because they're not established yet, or we're preventing them from buying in some way, shape, and form. And ironically, so now they require all of the services, but are not directly contributing to them. And people are gonna be like, what's he saying there? What's he implying? Like, I'm not implying anything. That's just the truth, right? Like if all of the, the majority, the vast majority of the money that the municipality is able to earn, and this isn't specific to health access, this is everywhere, is from the property tax and deed transfer tax. If that's the majority of it, then the people who aren't in that buyer pool or aren't homeowners are paying a fraction of it. And this is also why I explained to tenants, like when the rate goes up, when the rent goes up to pay property tax, that's you chipping in your share towards the municipal coffers to pay for these things. But this is the other problem. Like we're adding a lot of people here that aren't directly paying towards municipal services and yet they need those services. So is it time you think to get rid of the, so if I'm from Ontario and if I can't move there within six months, I have to pay 5% detransfer tax. Oh. Is it time to get rid of that? And is it time to get rid of the form buyer ban? Because that was, that was COVID. That was just the government coming in, looking like a hero. Okay, this is what we're going to do. And because now, I, I mean, I can't say for the rest of Canada, but our market, it's just local Heligonians with no sense yeah. of urgency. When they find the Cinderella house that they want, it fits, they'll buy. And buyers aren't just looking at one, they're looking at 10, sometimes more. And that was our market pre-pandemic. Like, that's what you and I have worked in this market, like for 10, 12 years. So is it time for the government now to step in? Okay, we have to change. Yeah, I think it's now becoming such a non-issue that you might as well get rid of it. I think we do need to monitor like vacant investment in property, but the market's slow. No one's buying condos to sit them empty anymore. And they've no. already gotten rid of short-term rentals for all intents and purposes here in the province. So yeah, the thing that they thought was a problem, whether it was or not is debatable, but the thing that they thought was a problem is now a moot point. So you might as well get rid of it. And again, I ret with respect to the foreign buyers, I return back to this idea of like, we want them to come here, but for some reason, we want to make it very difficult for them to buy a home. So you either yeah. want them to lay down roots and become part of our communities, or you don't. Like, which is it? Because the end result is going to be, we bring these people here under these false promises. We say you can't buy a home. You have to work a job that frankly, none of us want to do. And then by the way, you have to pay extortionary rent, right? Yeah. And they're like, why would I stay here? And this is what is going to happen to our country, not just in our province, but they're going to leave, right? They are going to leave because they were sold a bill of goods that we're not delivering on. And then we're gonna sort of be back in a similar problem you know, it's just very, it's all very short-sighted policy, in my opinion. I would have to agree. Well, I'm not going to take up much of your time. Uh, maybe I'd get you in uh, a couple of weeks and talk about the new Tressa Act that's happening uh, in the Ontario market as of uh, December 1st. So that's it for now, and I totally appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me.